Καλώ ήρθατε στο Στέγη. Καλώ ήρθατε στο Στέγη, το Ελλάδα Cultural Center. Our guest today, for most of you, our guest needs no introduction. You already know a lot about him. Still, I believe that before we call him on stage, it is important for us to touch on various of his achievements. No doubt, he is the star of today's crime stories and novels. His books have been translated into more than 40 languages, they've sold more than 36 million copies the world over. And actually, in 2011, it's, it was estimated that uh, a copy of his book was sold in 2011 every 27 seconds. Beyond that, this is a person that's lived many lives. He's been a football player, he's been a journalist, he's been actually a uh, stockbroker, he's been successful at most, and he's also been a rock star. Today, he's here in his capacity as a North uh, since we have the recent publication of Thirst, his latest book, and of course uh, Harry Holle, the legendary uh, detective, will be starring. And now, before we invite uh, our author on stage, let us extend our thanks to the uh, Norwegian Institute of Athens, the Embassy of Norway, the uh, uh, NASA Cultural uh, Foundation, uh, and uh, Metechmio. So, enough said, let's invite John Esbon now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined tonight by John Esbon. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. They, uh, they told me uh, five times before I went on stage, so I had to be careful that I didn't stumble in that thing there. <laughs> and I was on stage. Yes, <laughs> Anyway, you're, you're freshly welcome uh, to Athens. You just arrived from Kalimnos. You were there for yeah. three weeks or more. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been going to, to Kalimnos for five, six or seven years now, I think. It's, you go, uh, oh, it's you a beautiful, uh, beautiful island and they have probably some of the best rock climbing in the world at uh, Kalimnos. So me and my friends, we keep coming back. Well, that's a fact we didn't know, to be honest. I mean, as we were saying, we've never been to the island, but how, come, how, how did you become aware of this climbing? Uh, well, I, I think that in the, in, in the climbing community, Columbus oh. is uh, known all over mm -hmm. the world. So I, I just heard about it, and some uh, Norwegian friends of mine, they were uh, going there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I basically went with them. And, uh, you know, the first year I was there, I, I knew that I would be coming back to this place for, for, uh, for many years to come. Yeah, and perhaps Athens as well, because you were saying before that you find another uh, interesting place for climbing in Athens that we don't know about again. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah, great climbing in Athens. Actually, here you know, in walking distance from where we are sitting, uh, across uh, uh, Acropolis, uh -huh. you have some climbing routes, and also mm -hmm. around scattered around in the mountains outside Athens, you have great, great climbing. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, let's start. We would like to start this conversation. Uh, we would like to talk about the book about thirst that was recently published in Greek. Uh, the plot of this book kicks off with a Tinder date. That's a dating application that uh, is designed for men and women who look for love, sex, or both. Uh, why did you decide to use this application in this book? To use the Tinder? The Tinder, yeah. Um, well, I think it's. It started some years ago because, um, well, first of all, in Oslo, where I where I live and I write, I have uh, I bought this really nice apartment, which is you know just perfect for writing. It has an attic with a big big room with a beautiful view of uh, of Oslo, and I have a big desk there. It was especially made. For, for writing, I have my, my, my big computer there, I have my coffee machine, I have my music there, and it's the only place in the world where I cannot write. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, it's, uh, it's just, so I get up in the morning, I go up to the attic, I look at my beautiful desk, and I take my laptop, 
and I walked to my local coffee shop, which is like this tiny little coffee shop that is always too busy. So I have like my favorite table there, and it's always occupied. So <laughs> I, um, so what I do is I, I normally there is just one person sitting there. So I go up to my table and I sit across the person sitting there, and I stare at this person. <laughs> Until they understand that it's time to leave, <laughs> and then I can start start working. And um, sitting in this um, busy working uh, coffee shop, I, I normally I w listen to music and I use headphones to to sort of block out the noise in the in the coffee shop. But some years ago, I started noticing that there would be people sitting at the table next to me, like a, a man and a woman. And they would sit like very opposite to each other, and they would talk one person at a time, mm -hmm. uh, like it was a job interview or something. Yeah. And they would have coffee, and they would keep eye contact, and it would look very formal in a way, but still informal. And they would be, at least one of them, would be very nervous, like they were in a job interview. And then I realized that this is net dating. Yeah. This was before Tinder, so uh, but I I got curious, so I would you know discreetly turn down the the volume of the music and remove one of my headphones <laughs> and and listen into the conversation. And of course, it would be often a somewhat awkward conversation. Uh, they would say sometimes it would be boring conversations. Sometimes it would be extremely, uh, uh, extremely direct conversation, <laughs> and um, but 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 all the conversations were like dramatized in a way that it was almost like being in a theater or watching a movie because there were no rules. I mean, uh, those were the early days of net dating, and people didn't have like an etiquette for how to socialize mm. in a situation like that. And so it would be a socially naked situation. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, great for literature or theater or movies. So I started taking notes of the conversation, something that they said to each other. I'll just write it down and would save it for later. And so uh, when I started working on uh, the thirst, I knew I was going to use that situation, that, that sort of awkward situation between two people, that tense situation, that it was um, a good starting point for, uh, for my story. And of course, also for people meeting in a situation where you don't have established rules. Mm -hmm. I guess by now, these rules are already getting established. And uh, in some years' time, this will maybe be a very normal way for, for people to meet. But how can you be, be an observer? You say you go to this cafe, I guess everybody knows you in Oslo. I mean, you're so famous. How can you, how can you use this in your craft, you know, observing other people and taking notes? Uh, don't people recognize you and get self-conscious about, you know, you being around? Does this happen? I don't know. I I, uh, I guess I in in uh, Norway is 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 a very polite country. People don't and 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 it's a very egalitarian country. So they they don't make a fuss if they see somebody that they know from uh, uh, newspapers or or from television. Um, you know, even, even the royal family, they go to some of the cafes that I go to and they will sit down at the table and, and people will just leave them alone. And if they talk to them, they will probably not say your, your highness or something like that. They will address them by their first name, yeah. which is sort of a um, uh, sort of thing that you do in uh, Norway. So, so I, I don't get... You know, people, they don't uh, give me any extra attention in, in Oslo. Uh, if anything, they, they pretend not to recognize me. And, and for many years, I was sure that I would go undetected around <laughs> in Oslo. Yeah. 
And I can remember I, I went into a store, and this was just when, well, it was before I started writing books, but I was in this rock band. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would go into a store, and I would order uh, a painting that I liked. And the girl behind the counter, she would say, okay, and uh, um, I will have it ready for you in the frame by Tuesday. Um, so, and she said, so, so if I can have your name. <laughs> and then I would, I, and, and that was normal for me, I didn't th even think about it. And I would lean across the counter to, to have her spell my name correctly. And I could see that she had already written my name there. <laughs> But it was like it was a very awkward situation for both of us because I could, she would go red in the face, but I would go red too because this is you're you're supposed not to know you're supposed to you know yeah yeah I don't know who you are I don't know and I don't know who you are so we are equals you know it's uh, um, so um, uh, that was a long answer to a simple question no I don't get bothered when I'm sitting <laughs> writing in a coffee shop. <laughs> Uh, did you end up using uh, Tinder? Uh, I was thinking about it because, uh, but but then you would maybe have the problem of that people know, would probably know who I am. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it that made it a bit difficult, um, and also I could of course use a false name, mm -hmm. but then it would be like I would meet somebody under false pretense. And, you know, I, I wouldn't like people to, you know, come to dates having expectations to meet somebody. And there's a writer who's doing research, you know, so... so um, uh, but it was a, a friend of mine, a, a girl who's a, who's a climber too, and she was just uh, coming out of a relationship. And she wanted to try Tinder. And I said, yeah, do it. I can be a wingman, yeah. you know, so... Um, if, uh, if I can sort of, if you can report back to me. And, uh, and she did, so for um, nearly a year, I would sort of follow her adventures on, uh, on Tinder, um, which is, was much of my research for, uh, for what's uh, in the book. So some of the actual dialogues come from her experience. Sorry? Some of the actual dialogues used in the book uh, yeah. come from her experience. S some of it, but she's a nice girl. She's not like one of the one of the nasty girls in the <laughs> in the Tinder dates in the in the in the book. And, and and actually, you know, she is now together with a guy that she met on Tinder. Oh, yeah. that's good to know. But uh, anyway, Tinder kicks off the plot, but then again, a vampire come in, comes in at some point and uh, makes you think twice about using Tinder anyway. But how did that come about, the element of vampirism that you use in the book? Mm. I mean, the, the killer is a vampirist. Mm. Not a vampire, a vampirist. A vampirist, which is a different thing, which is yeah. like a psychological term for, for someone who feels the urge to, uh, to drink blood. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily from, from humans, uh, could be from animals, but uh, uh, I, was, I was actually doing research for another book that I was uh, planning. Uh, and I was sort of down deep in the dark cellar of psychiatry when I came across this term, vampirism. And uh, uh, something called Renfield's syndrome, which is another term for, for the same illness. Uh, and uh, I got curious because Renfield is, I remember the name of Dracula's uh, assistant. Mm -hmm. And uh, Actually, in the, uh, in the movie um, uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula by Francis Ford Coppola, and this is, this is a quiz for you, uh, there is Renfield is in that movie, and he is played by who? Okay, that's really easy. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's, uh, I like the fact that um, that it was a mix of science and the fiction. Mm -hmm. That it was sort of uh, 
life imitates art or, or vice versa. And, and um, I mean, that is the field that I operate in, is where fiction meets reality. So, so I, I think that there is something here. And there is also uh, the subtext of somebody getting, wanting to get so close to you, wanting to get so intimate with you that they actually would like to drink your body fluids. And this is sort of the opposite of Harry, who is struggling with intimacy mm -hmm. and who is at the start of the book in a very intimate relationship for the first time in his life. And he is at ease with that, he's happy with that. Um, so it was these elements that I wanted in the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the titles for your books are usually quite straightforward, like Snowman, for example. Uh, thirst uh, could be a reference to many things. We have the thirst that the killer has for blood. Uh, we have the thirst that uh, uh, Harry Holle has for alcohol. Uh, his thirst for his desire for justice. Uh, but also, uh, we have this uh, ambition of um, uh, secondary characters that could be described as uh, thirst as well. Um, uh, what was more important for you to allude to with the title? And is it also a reference to a book that you have said, uh, admitted you love a uh, lot, Knut Hamsun's uh, Hunger? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, good point. I, I, I haven't really thought about it, mm. uh, Hunger, but uh, uh, it is to some extent. It is uh, uh, the same kind of story. It's mm. love gone out of control in a way. Um, and, and, and people going crazy from, uh, from love. And, uh, and there's definitely a, a, a hunger. It's about uh, people living on the outside of this, uh, you know, uh, social democratic society where all people are supposed to be included. Um, uh, so uh, there are certain similarities, but I haven't really thought about that. Uh, I think that the, the title is, is sometimes difficult. Mm -hmm. it's, um, and, and the themes for a book is also some, sometimes you know from the start what you are going to write about. Sometimes you see it in hindsight. Maybe when you work through your book a couple of times, you see what it's really, what it's really about. Because you set out, I, I set out with a plan. I like to have plan my books in details, both when it comes to uh, the themes and the plot and the characters. So I can sort of tell my readers, you know, come sit closer because I have this great story to tell you and I know exactly where, you, where I'm going and where I'm taking you. So I'm, I'm, I'm the captain on board, trust me. Um, I like that feeling when I read a book also, that the, the, the writer has a purpose, that the story has a direction. And, and on the other hand, it's, there's also something that happens during the process of writing that you can't really control. There's an organic element, uh, you go with your gut feeling, and sometimes and there's also always a reason for the decisions you are making. But sometimes you don't realize uh, your, what you're thinking was uh, uh, before later, when you look back, and then you know what the book was really about. It happens a lot uh, when it comes to Harry, especially, I think, that uh, when I look back at some of my books, I realize that I'm writing more about my own life than I'm aware of at the time of writing. Sometimes it's just it's years later when I, for example, I go to, to, to Athens and I get interviewed by a book that I wrote five years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a fresh book, but uh, the first times I, when I came here, I would get interviewed about books that I, years since I wrote. And then I will realize that, you know, my God, now I can see that I was writing about what was going on in my life at that time. So, so anyway, there's, there's this um, subconscious that is at work too. Uh, and uh, I guess with, with The Snowman, that was a book that actually started with the title mm -hmm. The Snowman. 
that was an idea that I gave to a, to a friend of mine who was making a movie, mm. and he didn't use that title. So I said, okay, I, I, I think I like the title. It gives me a lot of ideas, so I'll keep the title. Um, with The Thirst, it, was, it wasn't until I had finished the book that I looked back at the book, and there were the things I had planned, but also some other things that I didn't plan when I started writing. And so I knew that, uh, you know, um, it was actually a friend of mine who came up with the... Th he, he, he read it and he said, uh, what do you think about the thirst? And I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but when you mentioned Harry Hole, or Harry Hole, and, um, uh, you know, he's a character, a dear, a close character, uh, a close friend of yours. Well, he has evolved. Uh, at the beginning, he was, you know, troubled yet innocent. Then he embraced his darker side. He committed crimes, and now, as you mentioned, uh, at the beginning of the book, we see him happy. Mm. How did that come about? And I don't know. Perhaps it's too early to ask if it has something to do with your own life, and uh, we need to to ask that question in five years' time. But why? Um. I think I, um, it w uh, it's a lo logic consequence of what happens at the end of the previous book at the, uh, at the uh, police, uh, where he, um, we think, and this is a spoiler uh, for those of you who haven't read the book, then again, <laughs> you know, you probably will understand he didn't die since there's a new book. Um, uh, so at the end of police, what seems to be a funeral is actually a wedding. Mm. Uh, Harry getting married to, to, to Rachel. Uh, and uh, um, so he's at the, at, the, at the start of the thirst. He is uh, he's a happy man. Yeah. But Harry, being Harry, is not very good at being happy. Mm. Um, so he is worried. He's waking up in the morning. His life is balanced, there's harmony, but he has the feeling that he is walking across a lake that has a thin layer of ice, and he can already hear the ice is cracking under his feet. And, and, and he just, for him, uh, what's the worst thing is the waiting period, because he knows the ice is going, at some point the ice has to break, he can't go on being as perfect as this. So he is, is sort of, I guess, in the back of his mind, he wants to provoke uh, the breaking of the ice, I think, so just to get it over with, mm -hmm. to get down deep in the cold black water. Um, so that's a, um, I just wanted that starting point of everything being perfect. Mm -hmm. and, but still that, that Music that that uh, alarm going the whole time in the background. That, of course, this is a crime novel with Harry Hall. It something is going to happen. But in an older interview, you were saying that the hell is awaiting him. Uh, is this the hell you were talking about, like being so close to happiness and not being able to grasp it, or you have other plans for him? Because a more serious hell than that. I mean, in the future. What, what's the future for him? Do you have, do you I, I, uh, you're sort of, um, I don't know how to put this. I, I, I can't really tell you. <laughs> it, it would, I can't, it, uh, it would be a spoiler, so I can't, okay. uh, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Yeah. Okay, shall we watch uh, something together?
killed them the first day of the snowfalls. How many were we talking about? Eleven. One here. Eleven. 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 We found another one. Which one was that? Detective Harry Holt. I received this letter two months ago. I think he wants us to trace it. Others dating back several years. The pattern is disturbing. I transferred from missing persons. Harry Hall. We studied your cases at the academy. They date back that far. Yeah, you're up there with the legends. I can't keep covering for you. Doesn't matter who you are. Tell me. I think it's the falling snow that sets the killer off. Then who does he need the snowman for? Building snowmen, cutting things up into little pieces, that's what a child does to establish order. A call just came in. There's another missing woman. We got the missing person's call. Who's missing? Sylvia Otterson. I'm Sylvia Otterson. Why would someone report you missing? He reported her missing before he killed her. I don't want a word of this to be leaked. It was a suicide. End of story. You sure he was alone? Where's well, Katrina? I received this. It's personal. He was watching us the whole time. He's playing games. the book trailer for Snowman, and that yeah. is its film adaptation. The reason we wanted to show you, to show everyone both, is like, you know, I don't know who came up with the uh, first Harry Hole, because he has nothing to do with uh, the one you describe in your book. Uh, he's tall, blonde, and the guy in the book trailer has nothing to do with, uh, you know, your description. Uh, and then we have uh, Michael Fassbender, and uh, He's the face of Harry Hall, and we were wondering, um, do you think that now his face will be irrestricably linked with uh, his? And will that affect your writing as well, since you're writing a new... You, you mean if, if Michael Fassbender will be... No, no, he's the new Harry Hall. I mean, uh, now, in our, now we all have in our minds that Harry Hall has the face of mm. Michael Fassbender, the ones who... Uh, when we saw the movie, I mean... Now we tend to think about him. So I guess it's two questions in one. Like the first one, <laughs> the first Harry Hall that has nothing to do. No, with the first one, I think, uh, you know, I was just surprised. I think that was some students that they, they, they just put it out like a competition among film students mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, can you come up with a trailer for, for this book? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, with almost no money at all. And this was like, Ten, the first one is like 10 years or uh, 
10 years old or something mm -hmm. like that when it was uh, published in the uh, in, in UK and with no money at all they came up with that trailer yeah. uh, which I thought was really Im impressive you know I I don't expect anybody to to come up with a main character that looks like the Harry Hole I have in my head yeah. and I guess it's the same goes for the readers you know the person that they have in their head their uh, image of Harry there's no actor that perfectly um, suits that description um, so I think in that regard you can just give up right away and say it doesn't exist maybe it could be Nick Nolte mm -hmm. you know he's the only actor I could think of that would to have the craziness and the you know brutal look of, of, of Harry but so the important thing is probably that you find an actor who is a good actor um, but um, yeah, so it was actually the first time that I, I haven't seen the snowman, the movie, and it was actually the first time that I saw the trailer really? right, uh, <laughs> right now. Uh, you know, I have to confess something. I actually have a taller and a bit heavier version of you when I read the, the books for yeah. Harry Holle. Yes. Okay. Uh, what's the ugly, weirdest ugly, thing? Br brutal guy with a scar. And, yeah. yeah? yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what's the weirdest thing you've heard about Harry Holler? What's the weirdest description anybody or comparison, comparison anybody has made to you uh, about him? Well, I most of, uh, one of the weirdest thing I, I heard, I think, was it, it was quite early on when I um, it was a girl who would come up to me and. It was a big girl. I mean, she, she was good looking, and, but, but she was so big. She was like a basketball player, you know, with big hands. And, and she came up to me, and, and she was much taller than I am, you know. So it was a bit, and she looked down at me, and she was a bit drunk. And she said, Do you know that last night I had sex with a guy? And I was thinking about Harry Hole the whole, <laughs> the whole time while we were having sex. And I was looking out up at her, and I, I was thinking, okay, why are you telling me this? <laughs> um, we've read in an interview uh, that you've given to the New York Times that um, uh, you have used for research for your next Harry Hall uh, novel, a book by Dave Grossman uh, that is called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill, uh, in war and society. Um, in this book, um, uh, the author describes how um, the violence in video games, films, and um, a television um, can affect the audience into uh, being, uh, in a way, more able to um, imitate it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you ever worry that your books may cause the same effect? I do, yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's not something that I think about mm -hmm. on a on a daily basis, but sometimes I uh, I, I do think about that effect. You know, that I'm part of a um, entertainment industry that uh, that uh, you know makes it more maybe uh, you know lower the threshold a little bit for uh, for killing. Um, on the other hand, I mean, my, my job, my, my curiosity, my dialogue with my readers uh, is about evil and the nature of evil. And I think it's, it's important that you have art and you have culture that dares to go where you, you know, normally you don't there to go in an everyday conversation but that you are willing to 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 sort of take a detour and inspect the human mind uh, also what we call evil and ask questions whether evil exists and is it like something that uh, is the monopoly of serial killers and crazy people or do we all have the seed of evil within us uh, and in order to tell those stories you need violence. Uh, on the other hand, I, I do see the problem of violence, brutality, uh, torture, and sadism being there for the sake of 
entertainment, mm. that we are curious about violence. There is something about violence that draws us to, to, to violence. And that you may develop an unhealthy relationship to violence uh, through your curiosity for violence. Uh, <clears throat> and when I wrote uh, the Leopard, uh, the book The Leopard, that was the book where I, in hindsight, must admit I, I feel I went too far. Mm. That I do think violence is important in my books to describe the monster, to describe what is at stake, to make you emotionally and logically understand that it's important that uh, the heroes uh, of the book s will stop this monster, will stop what is going on. Um, but I think in The Leopard there were a few scenes where I maybe got carried away with what I at the time maybe felt was my ability to describe violence and say this. And, and it wasn't really needed for the story. This is not the whole book. There is just, for me at least, just a few passages, a few sentences. But I, in hindsight, I can see those were not needed for the story. And I wish I didn't write them, but I did. But there's this standing joke about Scandinavian crime fiction in general that, you know, uh, the villains, you know, tend to have uh, this uh, behavior, uh, behavioral extremism. So I don't know why that is. I mean, it has been said as a joke again that it has something to do with the high latitude that induces them, induces them to that kind of behavior. But what do you think? Two plausible explanation that we found is, for example, the, about this phenomenon, and especially in the case of Norway, Way, is that the discovery of oil off the Norwegian coast back in the 60s, you know, uh, created uh, a new privileged uh, class and the crime novel became a, a means to express uh, negative feelings such as fear and resentment. And the other one is that uh, Norwegians are almost, uh, you know, embarrassed by the, by the accolades that are heaped on their society. It's a perfect society for everybody's standards. So in a way, they're trying to show the world that, you know, no, we can be evil as well. So what do you, what do you think? Well, I think that um, there's, first of all, uh, when I get questions about, you know, the position of the crime, crime fiction in Scandinavia, uh, what I really want to answer is, I have no idea why, uh, why crime fiction is such a big thing in Scandinavia. And, uh, you know, people come up with different uh, explanations. And I, I try to come uh, across as smart and intelligent. <laughs> so, I, so I try to give, uh, you know, an answer that maybe or may not be the truth. But I, I think it may be a bit simpler than that. I, I think that... Um, in general, I think in, in history, when we talk about cultural history or the history of literature, the element of coincidence play a bigger role that we are willing to admit. If we look at you know the last 50 years, the trends in literature, there may be a lot of just coincidences. And I think one of those coincidences um, is Sjöval and Valle, who within the 70s sort of start the Nordic noir crime fiction wave by writing political books that took the crime novel in Scandinavia from the kiosks and into the serious bookstores. Mm -hmm. And it also, because they paved the, wave, uh, the way for other talented writers, um, you know, who could, saw that they could use the crime fiction genre to tell their stories. Uh, suddenly there were all these crime writers from Scandinavia that some of them were writing, you know, good books. Not all of them. There's just as much bad crime fiction coming from Scandinavia as from, from anywhere else. But there were so many of them that some of them were bound to be quite good. Uh, I think that is the reason more than, you know, uh, you know, some say, is it because you have these dark, long winters, and like you said, is it because they, you have such an orderly, well-organized, peaceful society? Uh, I, I mean, could be that too, that we, 
sort of the Scandinavian societies where, like I said, everybody is included, or almost everybody is included. It's a politically, it's a, there are societies of, uh, 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 of agreement, of consensus. Um, if you take what we considered left wing to right wing, it's not that, it's not that big a span. They are more or less all social democrats, just to different degrees. And, uh, and so in that society where everybody, where you don't really need to rob banks, you can get your money on the welfare, you know. Uh, why rob banks? And that's why I think criminals have sort of become the, the last rebels of society. We are curious about crime and about criminals because they, uh, it's like, why do you want to be a criminal? It's, it's, it's a hard life. You don't, you don't have to work here. You can just get your money and have a peaceful life, you know. And, and, and so I think we are maybe, a, it's very, ex being a criminal is a very exotic thing in Scandinavian uh, countries. It, it um, yeah, makes us curious. And actually, I, di I did, I did some research on bank robbers with my novel Nemesis, and it was interesting. I mean, I interviewed and talked to uh, bank robbers, and I also looked at some research being done on bank robbers, and the motive for bank robbers in Norway during the 90s, where you had a lot of, you know, big bank robberies, almost like if you've seen the movie Heat, it was like that. It was like battles in the streets of the city of Stavanger, where they would have automatic weapons. And by the way, all the criminals that were arrested after that bank robbery, they knew more or less all the lines from Heat. <laughs> so it was like, this was really like life imitates art. And when, you, uh, when uh, they did research on those bank robbers, they saw that their motive for robbing banks were money, of course, but almost as important was the kick, the, the suspense that they got from robbing banks. So uh, I think it has something to do with that also, that it is so peaceful and boring living in Scandinavia that you have to have a little crime either in fiction or in <laughs> real life. Uh, do you become obsessed with real-life mysteries? I mean, a few months ago we had um, uh, uh, th this uh, situation with Peter Madsen in um, Denmark, uh, this Danish invader with the submarine uh, who allegedly murdered um, a Swedish journalist and her decapitated body was found uh, in a bay near Copenhagen. Do you follow stories like this? Uh, uh, more than the average person. Nowadays. Well, I, I, I do follow this specific story. I I do follow a little bit because it's just too crazy. Mm. Uh, but uh, um, I I don't I don't write real crime, and I I think I've done enough research on real crime to realize that real crime is in general not very well suited for for literature. If you want to you know, talk about the nature of evil, you don't really find it in among the regular criminals. What you find there is more, you know, uh, social dysfunctional families, background with drug abuse, uh, absent parents. So you, you find social problems. You don't really find that core of of uh, evil, at least you don't find it m more there than anywhere else in society. So I might as well use very normal, functional people in my stories to to describe something that may feel relevant for uh, readers in uh, in general. Um, and, and and so I find, well, in general, I find real crime uh, uh, depressing. Mm. And uh, it's just a uh, and frustrating because it's a lack of it's just something that's lacking in in, in in people's lives, and I don't find there's that much to learn from it really.
not that has to do with the element of 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 evil, for example. Uh, Apart from Scandinavian fiction, crime fiction, uh, we have the international success of uh, Scandinavian TV shows like uh, um, The Killing, The Bridge, um, and uh, you have written a, a script for a drama called uh, Occupied, uh, and you have chosen a plot that doesn't seem drenched in blood um, as much as your uh, novels, anyway. Uh, how did you decide to steer away from the who done it concept? Mm. Well, um, Occupied is a, it's, it's a TV series, uh, and they just uh, uh, started the second season now, and it's about um, sometime in the in the near future where uh, Norway has a, um, a, a green political party that is in, in power and so they decide to stop uh, producing oil and um, uh, this provokes uh, the EU and the United uh, US and so there's sort of a and Russia occupies Norway in order to make Norway force them to keep producing oil. And it's sort of a silent agreement with the rest of the Western world that they will not react to this, Norway being part of NATO. Uh, and uh, so, but the way they do it is they just keep producing oil, but it's a silk occupation. Um, when you wake up in Oslo, you will read your newspapers, you will look at television, you will look outside, nothing has changed. You can still go to Athens for your vacation or to uh, London to watch a Premier League match and, and, and shop and go back. So it, you don't really feel that your um, freedom has been restricted. Sometimes you can see there's, you can hear Russians in the streets and you can maybe see a military vehicle. Apart from that, life goes on. And so the question is, in a situation like this, where Norway has sort of given up because they have no allies, um, and your life seems to be more or less the same, you have the same standard of living, what are you as an individual willing to sacrifice for words like freedom, sovereignty, democracy, uh, independence and I guess the questions uh, the question why I wanted to ask that question is that in Norway we are still so uh, preoccupied with World War II um, Norway is a young nation it won its uh, independence in 1905 so a nation need to build need to have a self-image and what do you build that on? Where, in Norway's case, um, I think it's about the polar explorers of the ninth, you know, Nansen and Amundsen, and then it's our idea of the Norwegian resistance movement during World War II, which was uh, uh, to be honest, very limited. Uh, you know, it's, but it's still we cling to this idea that we resisted the Germans. Um, on the other hand, you would find Germans who German soldiers who spent five years in Norway during occupied Norway during the war mm. and came back to Norway after the war and said that yeah, we were in Norway, we were allies during the war. Allies, you occupied us. We, you were your, we were your enemies. Well, we didn't notice, <laughs> you know, and 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 this. So I think this there's this shame mm -hmm. also in Nor Norwegian society that yeah we try to see ourselves as you know fighting against the Nazis, but really did we? And this is this is what I wanted to address in in uh, Occupied. You know, what are we willing to sacrifice uh, on an individual level? Do we just keep our heads down, get on with our lives? And who will be the ones who will pick up the weapons first and resist? 
But this is something to do with your own family history as well. Uh, we know, I mean, you addressed the subject to another book about your father's involvement uh, in the war with the Russians. But I think that on your mother's side, uh, there were people uh, in the resistance, if I'm not mistaken. So that must have been like, um, uh, you know, a bipolar situation in your house, I guess, while you were growing up. Definitely, it, it, it's, it, it's a personal story also because I, uh, like you said, I grew up with my, my father who volunteered to, to, to fight with the Germans against Stalin. So he spent the war in the trenches outside Leningrad. Uh, uh, and my mother, who was, she was just a girl during the war, but she would run errands because my, my mother's family were in the resistance movement, so she would run errands for, for the resistance movement. Uh, so I, I grew up in a family where you had sort of both sides mm -hmm. of, uh, of the war. So it was something that I spent a lot of time, you know, talking with my, my father and my mother about. And what shaped your morality in the end? Because we've noticed that in your books there's an absence of faith, of a faith system that might shape the morality of a person. So it's of a god, let's say it, let's put it out there. So how did you become the person you are? with this, you know, uh, situation in the house, like having to address these issues? Well, I think that um, the, the most important way in which is it influenced me was that I think I realized that, uh, of course, who is wrong is, and who is right is decided by the winners. And that morality is, is, is also defined by, by the winners. And also that morality is not a godsend thing. It's, um, it's a thing that, that is uh, uh, something it, it, uh, useful uh, instrument that we use to, to run a society efficiently. It's not godsend and it, it, it changes quite rapidly in in, in most societies, as the society changes. But uh, I think his, uh, history is, um, is I, I talked to a historian who told me that, he said that the most difficult thing about writing about history is to put yourself in the shoes of the people living at that time. And um, blocking out the things that they didn't know at the time. They didn't see the future, so they didn't know, they only saw the present and the past and how the world looked for them at that time. And I mean, uh, ignoring the things that you know and try to imagine that you don't know these things, it's, it's, it's very hard. And I think that uh, at the outbreak of the war, in uh, 1940, my father came from the United States. Um, he and my uh, grandparents, they were anti-communist. Um, they saw the world as, uh, f first of all, the democracy of the United States was at the other end of the world, at the other end of the globe, and which actually meant something in, in the 1940s. So in Europe, it was the old democracies like France and England, they were more or less bankrupt. And so it looked like um, a duel between the two strong persons in Europe, Stalin and Hitler. And you had to make a choice. And my father made, made a choice. And uh, my father said after the war, when he had to spend three years in jail for uh, 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 fighting with the Nazis, he said that, well, I was wrong. And actually, I think I was, I was so wrong that being punished, I think that it felt fair because I I, I didn't realize uh, before afterwards what was really going on, what, what the deal was. Um, but I didn't have the information. I had no, so if you ask me if I would have the choice again, would I do anything differently? And he said, how could I? That would have meant I would have some kind of different information. And how could I have that information? I didn't have that information. So I would probably do the same thing over and over again. Um, and I think that is, um, that is what I learned is um, tolerance and um, a willingness to go and try to understand something you don't like, something you emotionally can't accept. 
but to try to go there and understand that individual, whether it's a Nazi, whether it's a, uh, a criminal, uh, whether it's a pedophile, whether it's anything. You know, I think it's the, um, the job of a writer to try to go there and try to say something about that individual and try to, whether you like it or not, try to see the world from that person's point of view. Well, that kind of brings me to the next question because uh, we, have the, we have the feeling that you like to read autobiographical books as well. And you mentioned some time ago that uh, one of your favorite books in the recent year were Karl Uwe Knausgaard's, pardon my pronunciation, <laughs> My Struggle, which is as autobiographical as it gets. Um, yet at the same time, it's a genre that you uh, run away from because it's the one that launched your career in a reverse way because you were assigned to write a memoir for the rock band. You go in and you couldn't get yourself to do that, so you wrote the crime fiction and the rest is history. But what, what is it that attracts you so much as a reader and makes you run away from it as a writer? Mm. Uh, well, I think that uh, First of all, I, uh, I don't have a very interesting life. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, then again, Karl Uwe Knausgaard doesn't have a very interesting life either. <laughs> but, but, he's, but he's extremely good at, at, you know, at describing the, the tiny, the, 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 the microscopic elements of his life. Um, and, and so, in a sense, we all have dramatic lives, of course. Uh, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I mean, I, d I do write about myself, like I said, when I write about Harry. Mm -hmm. I just don't realize it at the time of, uh, of writing. And uh, I think I'm, I'm interested. And I'm curious. I'm curious about things that make us tick as humans. I mean, I when I sit at an airport and I see somebody uh, leaving each other, you know, saying farewell. I look at them and I try to. I automatically. It's, it, uh, I, I try to imagine what are their lives like. Why? Why? What are their relationship, you know, um, what is play acting and what is real and, and who's got the upper hand in this relationship. All those thoughts that most people, you know, uh, uh, does when they look at, when they do people watching. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm not, when I look at that, I'm not part of that equation. I'm not part of that story. I'm just the observer. Uh, and I'm immensely curious about what's going on. Of course, at some level, that has to do with my own life and what I want from life uh, and what I fear and what I would like. Uh, but in my own mind, that's not part of the equation. It's just, like I said, five years later that I will find out. So I guess that's the reason you write. You need to, um, are there any demons that you're trying to satisfy inside? I mean, is it out of insecurity or is it what you just said, just that, that you want to observe people and, you know, observe life and put it down to paper? Is there any other deeper um, drive for this for urge? The stories? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think what it boils down to, again, when I get that question, I will, I will try to come up with a smart, intelligent answer. Uh, but it's, it's what, why do you really write? And is it, is it because you want someone to, you know, come up to you in the street and, and, and want to shake your hand and take a selfie? Uh, well, yeah. you do that, get That's part of it. That's part of it. But, but, but I think that, I think, first of all, I think it's social reflex. Mm -hmm. Why do you play music? You play music because you listen to music. You get inspired by music. And I think I write because I read. And I think it's the same social reflex that you have 
around the table of friends, somebody's telling a story that makes them laugh or cry or uh, feel something. And then, like by magic, uh, somebody else will take over and come with their story. And for some reason, you feel the need to contribute, to bring your own story, your best story to, to that table. And whether it's to get the group's acceptance or whether it's just a social reflex that somebody gave me a story, now it's my turn to, to, to bring back, to come back with the story and repay them. I, I, I think that's part of it too. I mean, I, I grew up in a family of storytellers. And when the family gathered, there would always be relatives telling stories. Very often the same old stories, so we all knew the stories didn't make any difference. Actually, we wanted to hear the same old stories told in a slightly different way. Uh, but that is sort of a, you know, I think that, especially in families, also in countries, like I talked about the self-image, stories define who we are. And it, uh, that is why we want to hear the old stories again and again, because it's about us. It's a story where we confirm who we are. And I, just, I talked to an old person some, uh, some years ago and, and she said that she was, we were talking about her friends that were dying. And she, says, she, she said something, she said that um, when, when my friends die, the stories die, the stories about us and about me. So I lose myself bit by bit because there's nobody to tell the stories to. And there's nobody who can tell me the stories that confirm who I am. Is there a manuscript of a novel that does not belong to uh, the type, uh, to the genre crime fiction, hidden in a drawer somewhere? Or do you not think about that at all? A story that is not a crime story? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, children books. Well, yeah, yeah, I have the children's book, and and I also uh, I, I did write a, a book of short stories mm -hmm. that are not uh, crime stories. So yeah, I I don't see myself as a crime writer because I'm interested in crime as such. Mm -hmm. uh, I I see myself as a storyteller. I mean, when I write the lyrics for for my band, uh, it's. Um, it's totally different stories. It's about growing up in my, from my home, in my small hometown at the, at the west coast in Norway. Um, so, but but just that the crime, the crime story is is a very good vehicle for telling certain stories. Um, the, the the sort of the where you have the mix of individuals and society. So, shall we take a break and what? Break and watch something again. Er fotball viktig? Hvis leken er viktig, hvis drømmen er viktig, så er fotball viktig. Og hvis øyeblikket skjønnhet er viktig, så er også fotball viktig. Og hvis det er viktig at vi har noe vi alle sammen, alle i hele verden, kan dele, så er fotball viktig. For fotball tilhører alle. Drømmen tilhører en fattig gutt i slumkvarteret i Brasil som er Pelé, og det tilhører en rikmannssønn som heter Martin Andresen. Og leken tilhører en fjortisjente som er fotballpunsj i Vardø, og en gutt på elfenbenskysten som vi ikke har hørt om enda. Og øyeblikkene tilhører ikke øyeblikkene også hos alle. Hva med det magiske målet til Maradona mot England i 1986? Hva med saksesparket til Odd Iversen og Meløs Stadion? Tilhører det Argentina og Vårenga? Nei, det tilhører oss alle. Det er våre øyeblikk. 
you should be a really promising uh, football player when you were uh, young. And you stopped because uh, you had an injury. Uh, how was, was it then? Did it seem like the end of your life at that moment? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I was only 19 at the time, so I think for a, for a short moment there it seemed like the end of the world. But uh, I think at that age you are uh, quite flexible and you, you readjust your uh, goals for, uh, for life uh, quite quickly. So I think I, uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a bad year, <laughs> maybe just bad six months, uh, and uh, and I, you know, I I realized I had to do something else. Uh, but I, I must admit, it was I think two years later when I saw my my friends that I played with uh, in Molde and they uh, were playing the cup final, uh, uh, and I watched them on TV. And then it was, I, I was a little bit heartbroken then, but uh, apart from that, no, it, it was okay. Are, are you still a very a passionate football fan? Yeah, well, I, um, I was, um, I can remember at the age of, I think I was eight years old or something, then my, uh, and I wasn't that interested in, in, in football at that time, but then uh, my, uh, I was more interested in playing football than in watching football. And I was watching a football magazine and it was, uh, I, there were some pictures of players at, of Arsenal and they have quite nice shirts, uh, you know, red and white shirts. Uh, uh, their football sucked at the time, but their shirts <laughs> were nice. Um, and so, uh, so I, 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 I like it. Then, then my older brother, who's five years older than me, he came up to me and said, no, 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 no. not Arsenal. You're top man supporter, <laughs> and will be for the rest of your life. And so, and he was my bigger older brother. I mean, so uh, he said, uh, you have to learn the the whole squad of top man by heart by Monday. And I did, of course. He's my older brother, so I've been a football supporter for the for my whole life, you know. And and and, and some years ago, uh, my my younger brother's son, my nephew. He was uh, six, six or seven years old, and I uh, was at my brother's house, and I saw him looking at some pictures of some Manchester United players. So I walked up to him and said, "Oh no, no, no!" <laughs> and he's a Tottenham supporter too. <laughs> um, uh, you get the talent in football, um, and uh, uh, in a way, you become successful. You have become successful in many things. Uh, without allegedly trying too hard. Uh, for the past few years, uh, you have started um, climbing, you love climbing, and you've said that at the beginning it wasn't easy for you. Were you ever tempted um, to, to stop because it, it was more difficult than you expected it to? The, the climbing. climbing, yes. Yeah, n no, not, uh, not to stop, but I'm not a, I'm not a natural climber. Mm. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess I'm, I've been sort of fortunate that some of the things I've started doing, I've, I've become quite good at it quite quickly. It was not the case with climbing. I didn't get climbing. I would have, you know, uh, I started climbing with girls that would be, be, be much better than me in no time. Actually, I would be climbing for two years and then the girl would start and she would be much better than me in, in two months. So it was, uh, I didn't really, then again, you know, in, in, in climbing, there is no real difference between girls and, uh, and boys because, well, it has to do with girls for some reason. They technically, they are, seem to have better balance and better understanding of climbing. Uh, but um, for me, it was also overcoming my fear of heights, which I always had. Uh, uh, and so it was, you know, doing that, for me, it was a very interesting inner dialogue that I had with myself, the, 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 the sort of uh, the scared heart and your logic brain that would tell you, this is not dangerous. If you fall, okay, you can maybe fall 10 meters, but you'll be in a rope, so you will not die. And have that brain trying to persuade your scared heart to go on climbing. And uh, so I don't have talent, but I have willpower, 
And so I, I, I kept on climbing and climbing and climbing, and gradually I would get better. Uh, but, so, and, and, but the reason I love it is because I don't get tired of that inner dialogue, that feeling of confronting your own fears and mastering your fears. But also it's very lonely, as you say, you have this inner dialogue. But I must say that you have been portrayed uh, in the media as a competitive person, at least when you were young. And I was wondering if football w would not be the ideal medium for you to, you know, express your sport uh, <laughs> drive. So, uh, I don't know, would you have succeeded, you think, in your football career had it not been for your torn ligaments that uh, prevented you from doing so? Statistically, uh, I, would, uh, I would be a total failure. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, I've seen so many players that were just as talented or more talented than, than, than I was, uh, that, you know, never lived to fulfill their hopes and dreams. That is, that is what normally happens, uh, sadly. But we, we tend to forget their names. Uh, it's only when we get reminded, do you remember that and that player? Yeah, he, he was supposed to be great, you know, and, uh, but it never happened. And um, so statistically, that is what would have happened to, to, to me. So uh, it was my fortune to be injured and to be remembered as the great talent that never lived to, uh, to disappoint my, uh, myself and the people around me. But that's not your only talent. Let's see the next video. Thank you, thank you. That was, that was last year. <laughs> Why do you think the audience laughed when they first saw you? Why they laughed? Yes. Well, it's because I look ridiculous. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, music plays a really big part in your novels as well. It's always present. Uh, I have the feeling, maybe I'm mistaken, but you will tell me, that sometimes you punish the characters that you don't really like with bad taste in music. And there's a, a reward for the characters that are likable, and they like uh, the, bands that, the bands that you like as well. Uh, is that the case? Yeah, well, I've... I think that you know it's um, having people um, in your stories to, to to reveal what they like culturally, whether it's movies or uh, or uh, literature or or uh, uh, music. It's 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 a very efficient and quick way to tell something about who they are. Uh, I mean, if uh, it's in. Uh, uh, the American Psycho by uh, by Bret Easton Ellis. It's uh, it's 
It's when you understand that the that the, the the main character in the novel he 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 didn't like Genesis uh, when P Peter Gabriel was was the singer. He just started liking them um, when Phil Collins took over. That's when you understand that this is a really evil guy. <laughs> so uh, you know. So yeah, yeah. I do I I do use references. Uh, like that to, to tell something about people, but often, I mean, if you, if they wear a T-shirt with a certain band, mm -hmm. Metallica or something, you know, it's it's often then it's not necessarily about what they like and who they are, but how they want to be perceived. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, also about yeah showing the signals that people send to the to the world. And uh, uh, what would we what would we be surprised to find on your Spotify list these days? Ah, uh, what you would be surprised to find? Um, well, I, I I did have for a long time. I actually made long speeches about Roman Keating's um, life is a roller coaster, um, and 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 why it's a hit. Mm -hmm. And I would pinpoint to certain things in the arrangement and certain, for example, the fact that the hook line is uh, one word too long. So you get like it's a beauty spot. It's like a, the thing that is not completely square. It's quite square, that, uh, that uh, song. Uh, but it's uh, just, just um, yeah, uh, about I like pop songs. Mm -hmm. I like really, you know, uh, cheesy pop songs. Yeah. Such as? <laughs> Sorry? Such as? Such as Ron and Kitty. That, uh, that song. I don't like everything that's cheesy, but uh, certain pop songs that I, that I really love. And uh, we have one last question. Um, if you could trade your success as a musician and as an uh, author, uh, with a really huge career in football, would you do it? If I if I could change my career as a writer with yes, uh, as as a soccer player, you know, uh, did you know that uh, Elton John and Rod Stewart, who would also play football in their in their teens, uh, they were asked the same question whether they would change their music careers with playing one final. F FA Cup final at Wembley, mm -hmm. and they said, uh, I think both of them said, that's easy, you know, they would play the, the Cup final. Uh, I don't know, uh, no, I mean being here in Athens, it's easy, of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything from with being here with you guys. <laughs> So now we would like, thank you so much for this interesting conversation. So we w I'm sure that the audience has a lot of questions to make, but we would like to uh, ask them to be very specific, to, to make questions, not statements. And uh, also we want to tell them that afterwards uh, Mr. Nesbo is going to sign books in the foyer. Yes, we would say it in Greek. Ο κύριος Νέσμο θα υπογράψει αντίτυπα των βιβλίων του στο Φουαγέ μετά το τέλος της εκδήλωσης. Απλώς θα ήθελα να σας παρακαλέσει για την καλύτερη εξυπηρέτηση όλων ε, ε, ο, να φέρετε μόνο ένα αντίτυπο ο καθένας. Ε, θα, θα βάλει μόνο υπογραφή, δεν θα κάνει αφιερώσεις. Και επιτρέπετε να φωτογραφίσετε, αλλά δεν θα ποζάρει μαζί σας. Θα μπορείτε να φωτογραφίσετε, αλλά δεν θα βγάλει μαζί σας. Θα βγάλει μαζί σας, αλλά δεν θα βγάλει μαζί σας. Θα βγάλει μαζί σας, αλλά δεν θα βγάλει μαζί σας. Θα βγάλει μαζί σας, αλλά δεν θα βγάλει μαζί σας. Θα βγάλει μαζί σας, Uh, photos. So, over to you. Kanis, the curious here. Περιμένετε λίγο το μικρόφωνο. Okay. Uh, you're one of the best uh, crime fiction writers at this moment. Uh, what other five uh, writers would you recommend to people who want to just start at this genre? Uh, you mean crime, crime, crime writers? Crime fiction writers, yes. I, I, you know what, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not a big crime fiction reader myself. I, I read a lot, but not, not particularly crime fiction. Uh, but I would definitely recommend Jim Thompson, 
who is my favorite, who, I, I mean, I mentioned American Psycho, and he would be the guy who would actually write, I think, the original American Psycho during the 50s and 60s. Um, and you have uh, books like uh, The Killer Inside Me, Population 1280, great novels. Uh, James Elroy, I, uh, I really like. Um, I think uh, Mystic River by Dennis Lehane is a great novel. Um, and uh, I mean, there, 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 there are so many. Lawrence Block, I, uh, I quite like. Um, yeah, you said five, that's four. Uh, <laughs> is four enough? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, uh, what's your opinion about the science fiction genre, and if you have been tempted to write such a story? Science fiction? Um, well, I was, a, I, I, did, I, I was a keen reader of Ray Bradbury when I was, uh, you know, in my, in my late teens, I guess. So I read more or less everything that Ray Bradbury ever wrote. And uh, I, I think, like, uh, I... Yeah, I, I did say that, you know, the crime fiction genre is good because you, you can write about society and the individuals. And I, I definitely think that science fiction is, uh, is the same thing. And uh, in a way, I mean, Occupy is science fiction in a way. It doesn't have the advanced technology, of course. But it's still, it's a, uh, what, it's a kind of what-if story. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess I could write science fiction. It's, it's been a while since I read science fiction, but uh, it's definitely a genre that I, that I like. Uh, when you set up a profile for your uh, criminal in a novel, do you give more attention to the motive for, of the crime or other features that will make the plot more spicier, more interesting to the reader? Could, could you please, please repeat that? Do you give more attention to the motive for the crime when you the set up the motive for the crime, or, or, the, or other uh, features of the plot that will make the yeah. will make it more interesting, maybe or more? Yeah, it's it's. Um, I'd say that I, I both, of course. But uh, uh, this is a question: Do you uh, stress the why or do you stress the how? I think that for for me, it's why is more interesting, but it's also much harder. Uh, the how is more constructing the story, and it's, in a way, it's more fun, but uh, the heart and the soul of the story is, is why. Um, but uh, they, they are sort of equally important, I think. Yes, hi, here. Um, where do you think the printed book will be in 10 years? We see CD dying. We have Spotify, we have iTunes. Where do you think book will be in 10 years from now? Um, I think that, well, um, uh, again, I, I, I have no idea. What do you think? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I, I don't have anything that, you know, I write books, I don't know much about books as such, but I, what I have seen, as you probably have seen, is that you know, uh, they predicted the death of the book 20 years ago. It's still around. So it's, a quite, a, it's quite a good, you know, it's quite a good invention. It works. But to me, it's really not that important. I, write sto I don't write books, I write stories. Uh, so whether you... Uh, have it an audio book or you read it on a Kindle or uh, uh, whatever, I, I really don't care. Uh, I, I'm a storyteller. Hello. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank My you. question is about uh, the book Police, and I don't want to make any spoilers, so I'm not going to say the name. But how did you feel about a certain uh, character from the police force uh, when they died, and why did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I could hear a slight accusation in you know, the, the, way, the, way, the way you put it. Uh, uh, well, you know, um, uh, I that specific character, I, I really love that character, and I care for that character. Uh, but, uh, how should I put this? Uh, but she had to go. It's 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 like it's it's a logic in the story, the the story the whole the arc of the story. I mean it's a, it's I mean I mean Greece. The story is a tragedy. The, uh, at its core, it's a tragedy, and so uh, these things happen. Hello. What intrigued you in uh, Macbeth play so that you make decide to retell the story? Sorry again. Macbeth. Macbeth. Mac Macbeth. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what intrigued you in Macbeth play so you decide to retell the story? Well, I was uh, Macbeth is a novel um, that is coming next year based on um, on uh, the play Macbeth uh, by Shakespeare, and I was. Um, I was contacted by uh, the publishing house that was going to publish a series of novels based on Shakespeare plays in connection with his uh, 400 years anniversary. And uh, I, was, I said that, okay, I, I will do it on one condition, if I can have Macbeth, uh, because I, I grew up with that play and I love that play. Uh, both the play and, uh, and the movie, and uh, there was even a, a translation in Norwegian that I read that was really beautifully translated. And uh, so I, um, uh, that was the reason, and also because I, I, I took some time, I said that, okay, I really love my pet, let me think about it for a month. And then I came up with an idea of how I want to do it. I want to do it set in the 70s, uh, with uh, and it would not be a power fight of uh, the throne of Scotland, but it would be in a corrupted, uh, polluted city in the 70s, uh, and it was a city that is on the verge of bankruptcy, and it's a fight of the position as chief of police, um, and there would be like two persons fighting for that, Macbeth and Macduff. So um, that was, uh, and the three witches in my Macbeth is not some supernatural witches, uh, you know, making this terrible soup. It's, um, it's uh, uh, they will be uh, drug cooks making methamphetamine, of course, and uh, selling, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, I'm a huge fan of your novels. I read the first one and end up reading all of them in like three months. So, my question is, your first two books took place abroad, Australia and uh, I think Thailand, the cockroaches, and then you go back to Norway and every other novel sets place in your like birthplace, like an homage to your birthplace, to Norway, to Oslo. Sorry. <laughs> okay, first two books, yeah. the bat and cockroaches. Set. And the rest in the rest in. The rest are in Norway, so yes. it's like an homage to your birthplace. An homage. Homage. How much? How much to my uh, to my birthplace? Uh, no. no. It's, uh, it's just. Uh, 
it's pure laziness. It's uh, I I know the place, <laughs> so it's like I I you know it's not like Oslo is is where I live, and it's the place that I you know it would be kind of strange for me to 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 write a novel from somewhere where I'm not living. Uh, but the idea for the first two novels was simply that for the first novel I was going to Australia and I was sitting in Sydney and it was just again laziness I would <laughs> write about the city where I was staying um, and uh, the, for the second novel uh, that was took place in Bangkok that was actually since you asked about science fiction it was the idea that the same idea that Ray Bradbury had in his March and Chronicles he would write a story from a planet where nobody had been, so we had like total freedom to uh, to write uh, about this mystic place. And for me, Bangkok was a kind of city I didn't know anything about, and I thought that at least my Norwegian uh, readers, uh, for them, it would be like Mars. So uh, that's why I uh, picked uh, Bangkok. But then I, after that, it was, yeah, he, he, he came back home, and uh, which is a natural move. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I see? I would like to ask you to talk about the unexpected in the Scandinavian countries. Υπάρχουν συστήματα κοινωνικής προστασίας πολύ ανεπτυγμένα. Όντως συμβαίνει αυτό. Όμως από την άλλη παρατηρείται μια βία από νεοναζιστικές οργανώσεις. Πώς εξηγείται αυτή η αντίφαση από την άλλη να έχουμε μια ανεπτυγμένη κοινωνία σε όλες τις σκανδιναβικές χώρες με ανεπτυγμένο κοινωνι... σύστημα κοινωνικής προστασίας και από την άλλη να μην μπορούν να εξαλειφθούν αυτά τα φαινόμενα της νεοναζιστικής βίας. Ευχαριστώ. Well, the question was, um, in Scandinavia, you said that there is tolerance and uh, also uh, there is welfare state for uh, most of the citizens. Uh, but also, for the past few years, we have um, violence coming from neo-Nazi um, uh, organizations towards immigrants or uh, people who are different. How do you uh, explain this contrast? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, it's, it's again, I'm a, uh, I'm a writer, so I try to be I'm just a writer, so I try to be careful when I uh, get these questions as if I'm, because I don't represent a uh, authority. I don't have any su superior knowledge uh, uh, compared to anyone who lives in, in Scandinavia in these matters. But of course, it's a fair question because in Redbreast, I wrote about neo-Nazism in, uh, in, uh, in Norway. Uh, I think it's, uh, but but again, I would be careful to give like an analysis uh, 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 on that. Uh, I'd rather read an analysis done by somebody who worked with these questions on a daily basis. Uh, but just from so so, just I've said that before. I give my view or opinion on uh, on that. Um, I think that it's a. Um, the, the kind of neo-Nazism in Scandinavia that I wrote about in, uh, in uh, uh, um, the Red Breast, it was a kind of neo-Nazism that didn't really seem to have a political goal. It was more a rebellion that they didn't really have a political program. It was hate propaganda, but it wasn't really, um, to call it neo-Nazism, was uh, w wouldn't be fair because they would use the Nazi symbols more because that was probably the symbols that would have the most shock effect in Scandinavia during the 70s and, and 80s. But if you look at the political program, it, it wasn't really a program. It was just hatred. And I think I see some of the same 
some of the same in uh, today's neo-Nazism, but now there is, of course, a political issue that is about uh, immigration uh, and refugees coming to Scandinavia. So now they have like a single political uh, issue that uh, that is on their, let's call it program. But uh, more than that, it's it's for me it's hard to see a political program. Thank you. Hi. Um, in reference to the snowman being turned into a movie, I understand that as a writer you would be reluctant at first about seeing a book of yours in, into the big screen. Was there a specific aspect of the book, other than the character's appearance, that you were concerned the movie wouldn't do justice? Well, I, I think that the reason why I was worried was that, uh, like you said, that you, you have an actor sort of uh, defining who her is, and I'd rather be that there would be, you know, each reader would have their own Harry Hole the way they imagine them, and, and, and same for me. That is, just that the movie is such a strong medium compared to the book, that it would sort of invade the universe and take over. <clears throat> but apart from that, I don't really see the movie as, for myself, I don't see the movie as a version of the book. I see the movie as a story in its own right. And I think especially with, with The Snowman, the director, Thomas Alfredson, uh, I talked to him uh, before the process started and uh, he said that he wanted to tell his own story. And I was okay with that. I mean, I, you have to respect that, that he didn't want to tell the story I had told. He wanted to make his own character and his own story. And I was fine with that, you know. It's, uh, I said, do your thing and, and, and whatever you can use in the snowman, uh, fine. Um, uh, but uh, so um, there was uh, Michael Ondaatje, the Canadian writer that wrote The English Patients. Uh, I met him in Canada and he told me about this friend of his that has had one of his books made into a movie and it was not a very good movie. And he met him in the streets and he said, oh, look what they did to your book. And he answered, they didn't do anything to the book. And I think that, that that is the way I feel about, you know, adaptions of my, my, uh, my books into movies. They are movies. They are different stories. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm very happy to see you. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, do you think that Harry Holler deserves to be happy or that he's too damaged to go to a happy place in the end? I'm not asking you for spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. Um, Just what you if think. He, if he deserves to be happy? D does he deserve to be happy because he has done many things, he's very damaged, and do you think that he can be happy? Uh, well, what, what I can say is that there, there will be pe periods of relative happiness. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I'll give you an idea or if you prefer a challenge. Knowing Greece, and especially the island of Kalymnos so well, could you write a real dark story about this island with this sun, this sea, the, the mountains and the hills based on I, Greek I, mythology? I, I have. <laughs> I have, you know. It's, um, it's in... Um, uh, Aris uh, Theolopoulos is, um, is uh, a, a great climber and he made many of the climbing routes in, uh, in uh, uh, Kalymnos and he has a, a, a rock climbing guide for Kalymnos and in, in the middle of that book I've written a, a short story about one of the routes he made, Mon Amour, at uh, Kalymnos and it's a really dark, scary story about climbing. And there's a couple of Greek gods in there too, I think. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. Thank you.
Thank you.